Order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 9, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Tom DeHart. I will then remain standing for a moment of silence. I ask you particularly to recall uh, former United States Senator Joseph Tidings, who died yesterday. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America First item on our agenda is consideration of the agenda. Mrs. White, are there any changes or additions? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier Mr. this Chair, evening. I, I have a, a motion for an, for an agenda item. Uh, I move that the board add an agenda item to discuss the modified motion to protect system records from destruction. Is there a second? All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. I'd, I'd just like to speak to the motion. I, I don't think there's, I don't think you need to speak to the motion to amend the agenda. Well, so. well I do, and the reason I'm bringing it up in open session is that I don't think that it qualifies for closed session. That's why I didn't <coughs> raise it earlier. Okay, very good. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, the motion fails for lack of majority. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act and for the following reasons to. Mrs. Causey. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So at the meeting two weeks ago, I asked for a motion to add the agenda item regarding transportation, which Ms. Hen had emailed the entire board and the board chair and the interim superintendent about several weeks ago. And that motion failed okay. at the beginning of the meeting So last. is there a motion? <laughs> Yes. Okay. What's your motion? Will I be able to speak to my motion? No, ma'am. It's just a motion to amend the agenda. That's it. And, and why motion. is it that we do not speak to our motion? Because I don't think you speak. I think Robert's rules say you don't speak to agenda motions. May I get a clarification that, on that, please? Is that please? correct? That's what I was told. Thank you for checking. It's debatable. All right, make a motion, we'll get a second, then we'll have your um, discussion. Thank you. Um, I make a motion to add an agenda item regarding transportation, regarding the questions that Ms. Hen sent in over four weeks ago. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. I would like to uh, add this agenda item because as I said, she sent in questions over four weeks ago. <coughs> then at the meeting two weeks ago, I requested to follow through with her item being added to the agenda which was voted down. And then I also made a motion to add it as an agenda item to this meeting, which was voted down. But my understanding was that you would take it under advisement to add that very important issue to the meeting. So my question to you, Mr. Chair, is how is it that we are supposed to add important agenda items that our constituents are continually speaking to us about if you do not answer our emails, nor the board uh, votes to add it at a future meeting? Is any, dis any further discussion on the motion? Mrs. Miller. I would also add that per policy, um, uh, it requires a, um, a unanimous vote, but it does say that when a request is put in for an agenda item, it does say that the chair shall add it. doesn't say when, but it does say that the chair shall add it. And, and I read that as not being something that could just be, you know, forever put off and ignored. All right, need further discussion. All in favor of the motion to add an agenda item regarding transportation, please raise your hand. 
One, two, three, four. The motion fails for lack of majority. Mr. Chair. Mrs. Miller. I move that the board add an agenda item to discuss issues around the rollout of devices this school year. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Yes. Um, uh, this is um, something that uh, obviously it's an urgent issue. Um, we've been hearing a lot from um, teachers and parents, which I have forwarded on to the board. And um, I think we are, it, it, it will warrant a good discussion. Any further comment or discussion on the motion? Mrs. Hen. Thank you. I'm also hearing from the community concerns about parents signing off on device agreements, um, stating that they will be responsible for the condition of those, receiving devices, um, bags, um, supplies that are not in acceptable working order, and being told that they have to accept those devices or else um, their children's instruction will be um, interfered with and yep. being told they don't have that choice. So it does warrant a discussion. It's timely, as Mrs. Miller has said. And if we cannot discuss this, I would move to amend the motion to add it as an agenda item for next meeting. All right, further discussion. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've also heard from a number of uh, constituents in a number of different areas that they do not have adequate access at home. And so one of the things that I would like to see discussed is what arrangements are being made for our students that don't have uh, sufficient internet service or broadband service into their home um, in order to utilize the devices as they're being used now for homework and so forth. Mr. Yulefelder. Um, I'm, a bit surprised. I'm a bit surprised because it just seems I haven't heard of anything from any constituents in my area and the handful of um, items that uh, were circulated um, certainly don't represent 113,000 kids. Uh, I can, now, according to uh, what I've already known, that there is a service available to everybody in, in Baltimore County, and particularly my understanding is if there's a Title I school or a child is enrolled in free and reduced lunch, that they do get service, and if not, there's uh, Comcast has provided a $9 and change uh, per month uh, service uh, for all our students. Further discussion on the motion? Um, you both have both spoken. Um, Mrs. Miller. There are a number of issues and questions that I submitted, and this would be an opportunity for us to get uh, answers on those questions. Very good. Mrs. Causey, last comment before we vote. Thank you. Just to speak to Mr. Ufelder, um, maybe he hasn't received any. Other people have. The fact is, is that we do have an information technology department. We do have a curriculum department that should be tracking this and can give us the information. Is it just a few, or are there, in fact, a lot of service tickets? Are there, in fact, a lot of issues? Right, so and as to that, the availability... That would, that would be the part of the agenda if we had this on the agenda. Yes, which is right. supporting why we should have it on the okay. agenda. Any further comments? Yes, the other point is, to Mr. Ufelder's point, is not every area even has Comcast available to them. Okay. There are many rural areas that do right. not but that's have not, that's internet not the, access. That's not the issue. The issue is one is that whether, needs The to be issue discussed. is whether we Thank should you. have an agenda item about uh, device rollout. Mrs. Miller. The fact that the Safety and Technology Committee has not met since spring, um, that means that the only opportunity for us to get input would be at a board meeting. All in favor of the motion to add the device rollout as an agenda item, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. The motion fails for lack of a, a majority. All right. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and the informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash back uh, slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. All right, next on our agenda is um, selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right. Ms. Adekoya will pull them and Mr. Sort will read them. 
Our first is Trina Littlejohn. Second is Diana Bergman. Three is Muhammad Jamil. Four is Sarah Sales. Five is Josh Landers. Six is Dr. Bosch Sharon. Seven is Sharon Seroff. And that is it. So it is time for our public comment. This is one of the opportunities for the board uh, to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns or comments to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the system, it is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes. I uh, ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you uh, see that your time has expired. I now call on our advisory groups to speak, and the first is the uh, uh, TABCO, and that's Abby Baton. Good evening, Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. This Sunday, there was an op-ed article in the Baltimore Sun addressing testing. The title of the article is Testing Student Learning. It is written by Joseph Gannam, who is a professor at Loyola University, Maryland. As we are in the process of changing to a new test for our students in Maryland next year, Professor Gannam makes the case for rethinking the purpose of these tests. His premise is we should not be testing to determine what a student does not know. He points out that students who know everything already on a test could have spent the entire year learning nothing new, while a student barely speaking English who is just learning the language but has made substantial progress learning English could be labeled deficient despite all the strides made during the year. What is even more compelling is those students whose skills in bilingualism or sports or the arts, etc., are labeled deficient. The idea that all students must know the same things is a problem for our society. We should embrace all knowledge and build on that knowledge. In Professor Ganim's words, standardized tests are a counterproductive response because they do nothing to eliminate these structural inequalities while seeking to erase the human diversity that is essential for a vibrant and thriving society. We all must fight for reasoned testing that ensures the best for each of our students being taught and assessed and addressed. Again, in Professor Ganin's own words, our children are not robots manufactured to comply with identical product specifications. They are human beings and should be treated as such. And all students should be challenged to learn regardless of whether or not they meet the standards. In our schools, learning should be the standard. We must fight for our students, not for some artificial standardized test to prove the unprovable. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. That's Megan Stewart Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, members of the board, good evening to all of you. It's nice to be back for another two-year term as the chair of the CCAC, and I'm glad to have started our monthly meetings for this school year. At our first meeting of the year last week, we heard updates and priorities from the Office of Spe Special Education. I want to thank all Office of Special Ed staff who attended. There are too many to name, which is wonderful. We also love meeting executive directors from the various zones, so I wanted to especially thank Heidi Miller for having attended. As one update, especially with October as Dyslexia Awareness Month, I want to highlight the, part, the continued partnership between the Office of Special Ed and ELA in providing literacy training. 
As we all know, it is incredibly important to identify reading challenges early and provide pathways for our students to develop reading and writing skills necessary for success. Training continues with the letters program through ELA, but even more exciting for us is the continued training in Orton-Gillingham. Throughout last year, we were thrilled that the goal was being met to have someone trained in all elementary and middle schools. Now, Orton-Gillingham training will include special educators in high schools and also reading specialists. The successful partnership with the OSE and ELA providing intensive literacy training continues to make a huge difference in the lives of our students and teachers. This year, we will also be working on possible ways to improve the IEP team process. We spend some time here talking about the behavior of students. I want to talk for a minute about the behavior of grown-ups. It is natural for emotions to run high during some IEP meetings, as hopefully people around the table are all highly invested in a child's present and future success. While emotions and disagreement are both natural and unavoidable, there is nothing acceptable about yelling, screaming, or treating people with general disrespect. Frustration is not a free pass for bad behavior. This is unacceptable for both parents and school personnel. This year, we will be collaborating with the Office of Special Ed, parents, IEP chairs, and community stakeholders to share our beliefs about a collaborative and civil IEP team process. It is our goal to unite in our message about maintaining civility by all IEP team participants. We look forward to engaging in dialogue and sharing our recommendations and work in December. Finally, as always, it will be a high priority for us to support an increase in staffing during the budget process. We will continue to advocate for requests for special education teachers, paraeducators, IEP chairpersons, and other related service providers. Our next speaker is from the Baltimore County Public Schools Organization of Professional Employees, Nick Argyros. Good evening, Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, and board members. I want to share with the board this evening that the Organization of Professional Employees, OPE, is extremely excited to launch a professional development training program for our, non, or for our professional non-certificated employees. The training initiative resulted from a conversation I had with Mrs. White. During that discussion, we realized that BCPS needs to have a formalized professional development program for our non-certificated employees who are part of the OPE bargaining unit. The reaction from Ms. Way was, let's make it happen. OPE collaborated with a division of organizational effectiveness, and in a very short time frame, we created a training program designed to, with a comprehensive range of devo developmental subjects. Topics include leadership, personal development skills, and a wide range of other topics which, which will, will complement current professional training programs offered by BCPS for non-certificated employees. We owe our professional employees this opportunity to enhance their skills. They are the specialists and experts of the organization that do the work behind the scenes each day to keep our school system running smoothly and efficiently. I want to thank Mrs. White this evening for supporting the development of the training programs. Billy Burke and his team for working closely with OP to develop the content and planning, and Kevin Smith and his team for their support. Thank to all of you here this evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, from Case, and that's Tom DeHart. Good evening, Chairman Gillis. Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, and members of the board. October is Principal Appreciation Month. As an Air Force brat who attended 13 schools in 12 years, literally from Maine to California, I experienced a lot of principals, who I recall as old veterans who had kind of worked their way up and are finishing their careers there. 
William White described these middle managers <clears throat> in his 50s classic, The Organizational Man, as an overseer of buses, boilers, and books. In today's rapidly changing era of standards-based reform and accountability, a different description has emerged. Today's principals contribute 25% to student achievement and no longer function only as managers, although that task remains on their plates, but rather as leaders of learning who can develop a team delivering effective instruction. The Wallace Foundation suggests the principal leadership entails five key responsibilities. Shaping a vision of academic success for all students that's based on high standards, creating a climate of hospitable a climate that's hospitable to education in order that a safe cooperative spirit and other foundations of fruitful inter interaction occur. Cultivating leadership in others so that teachers and other adults assume their parts in realizing the school vision. Improving instruction to enable teachers to teach at their best and for students to learn at the utmost. And managing people, data, and processes to foster school improvement. These five tasks all interact with one another in order for any part to succeed and are undergirded by the professional standards of educational leadership BCPS uses to grow and evaluate principals. I've worked with principals across this state and Baltimore County has the best principals around. I would need three hours, not three minutes, to describe to you the care, perseverance, dedication, loyalty, work ethic, and professionalism they exhibit every single day for a 50 to 60 hour a week. And then principals really never go home as they carry their schools with them. Nationally, principal retention rates are plummeting. BCPS has new principal support in the form of principal mentors, as well as the shift in compliance to coaching at the zone level, and that's encouraging. But the position has great burnout potential. The principal's role may be the loneliest job in education, CASE encourages the board, central office, and the public to offer sincere thanks and appreciation this and every month for the tireless and stressful work these folks do. Often all it takes is a note, phone call, or visit to the principal to remind them why they undertook such a daunting role. Thank you. Thank you. Next is time for public comment. Our first speaker is Trina Littlejohn. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, um, Superintendent White. Um, good evening, and I just wanna go back a couple of meetings because I didn't have a chance to speak after. And I left the meeting a little bit upset over, um, there were several parents um, that came up and spoke and we were talking about um, student safety and climate within the schools. And there were several parents that came up and spoke and one gentleman spoke and he it was heartfelt about um, that his student ended up dropping out of school as a result of the way his student um, was treated. And. Uh, Ms. Miller, you spoke about how there were several um, teachers or staff with concerns that you, that you had voiced. And in all of that, nowhere did anyone mention the parents' responsibility. And I kind of want to go back to that because I feel like we keep missing that there is a parent responsibility. Very few Although the parents come and talk, very few of them stay. They get up and they leave as soon as parent comment is over. There's a few that stay the, the distance and listen to what goes on in this room, but very few of them get up here, say what they have to say, and they go on about their business. And if it's really about the children, plant your seat, your rear end in that seat, and stay the distance and do the work and put in the time. And that, that man that was so heartfelt that his son quit school as a result of bullying, where was he when his son was going through that? Because as a parent, it is my responsibility to recognize when my child is having an issue and go and advocate for him when he cannot. So where are the parents in all of this? Megan Stewart 
CCAC chair just spoke about that parents can't even be civil at an IEP meeting. If they can't be civil, then their children definitely don't know how to be civil. And we sat right here, I sat right here and watched you all fight Megan Shea in her quest to get a spending authority to be able to teach children how to be civil. So clearly they need to be taught because the parents don't even know how to be civil. So I just wanted to go back for a moment to that and say, parents have some responsibility in this. It's not just the school, it's not just the administrators, it's not just the teachers, and it's not just you. Parents play a huge role in this. And so I would encourage you to go back to your constituents and also ask them, what are they doing? Diana Bergman. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, Wow, so you know, I don't miss a Board of Ed meeting. And I enjoy staying here until the end, even though sometimes I don't see a lot of solutions. But in between the disagreements, I think we do find the solutions. So I wanna make sure everybody has their listening ears on. Because right now, as a parent of three children in our Baltimore County school system, we are missing the part of Team BCPS1 of working together. Mr. Gillis, hi. hi. Um, past few meetings, I see board members that are wanting to participate and parents having issues regarding our transportation department. And I think the bug stops with you guys right here. And that needs to be an agenda item. Because my children right now, we're having some transportation issues. We didn't request for transportation, but we had a cab driver show up to our house at 8.30 a.m. and I have a child on the autism spectrum that mistook that and spent two hours meltdown. The man in the blue car is gonna take me. And I know that's not what the cab drivers say. And for those parents out there that are surprised that BCPS uses cab services to transport some of our most vulnerable students in our system, we do. We use our cab drivers, we use shuttles, we use our special education buses. We have multiple ways of transporting students depending on their individual needs. And those transportation issues for these unique students come with a team decision, a team decision that is made as a team together in that IEP meeting in some of these cases. And when that doesn't happen and that safety plan is not put in place, of course Mama Bear comes out. I will still be a very respectful Mama Bear because I still like each and every one of you even when you disagree. But I am really asking for every single team member in BCPS, the parent included, that we have to find solutions to things that are concerning regarding safety in our community, like our transportation and our special education programs, our home and hospital programs. We have a lot of departments that make this big machine, and we have to figure out how to bite our tongues and work together, respectful, in the best interest of what counts, the student, the child. This is why we wake up every day to engage with each other. We have to figure out a better way to communicate with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mohammed Jamil. Good evening and peace be with you all. Some of you recognize me, and some of you haven't seen me before. I've been attending the board's meetings since my first child went to school in 1977. 
Since 1998, I have spoken before you over 78 times. I'm reminded of a letter, actually an appeal, that was to teachers written by a school principal who had survived the Nazi camp. He wrote, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no person should ever witness. Gas chambers built by brilliant engineers. Children poisoned by expert physicians. Infants killed by trained nurses. Women and babies shot and killed by high school and college graduates. So, he says, I am suspicious of education. My request is help your students to be human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, or educated maniacs. Reading and writing and history and arithmetic are only important if they serve to make our students human. So I ask, are we perpetuating a process of dehumanizing some of our fellow citizens who happen to be Muslims by depriving them of equal rights and equal treatment? We know our history very well, I hope. We are not a 250-year-old country with equal rights. Women's right to vote has not even completed 100 years. African Americans did not even get any rights and just about five decades ago. So if we haven't learned in the history that we're gonna discriminate against the Italians, against the Polish, against the German. All I ask is equal treatment for Muslims. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. Our next speaker is Sarah Sales. Hi there. Hello. I'm sorry I didn't get here sooner. Um, we've been addressing a family matter. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and talk. And I know I'm coming on the back end of your, on this conversation, um, but I did need to express my gratitude to the board for its commitment to restorative practices and the discipline initiative as a school teacher for Baltimore County Public Schools. This has not been an easy journey. It started um, at Randallstown High School with Aubrey Brown, an incredible leader, and has continued to my current school. Jay Ward is my principal now. It started with an article during my P PD, on a PD day. It led to a book study, went on to informal trial and error, um, internship with a behaviorist, and it arrived to a formal opportunity to participate in a class and join a school whose holistic support surrounds this program. It's excellent, it's fabulous, and it really does deserve our support. It's not easy. It is a, both a classroom instructional strategy as well as behavior support for me. Our children have not changed, our students, but the environment and conditions that they live in has changed. It's very different from when I grew up. Um, and we can no longer afford, I can no longer afford or even think about or long for supposedly good old days that may be in place, because they weren't, um, and they were very exclusionary. So for us as teachers, I feel like this is a great opportunity to seek out and explore new venues so that all of our students are successful. And for me, restorative discipline has been a great experience. So I just wanted to thank you all for supporting it. And I know that you have questions, and I believe that, that they're honest questions. Keep looking for those answers, because it is well worth it, and it really does serve our students. Thank you.
Thank you. Our next speaker is Josh Landers. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Interim Superintendent White. Uh, I want to take a couple of minutes. Um, I came in here with some specific thoughts to talk about, but I actually want to address the uh, director of CCAC and Ms. Littlejohn, who just spoke. Um, she talked about parents' responsibilities and how many parents will sit here and talk, um, but then will leave shortly afterwards. Um, Ms. Littlejohn, I've been awake since 4 a.m. this morning, and I've been supporting and taking care of four of my six children, along with working a full-time job and running a nonprofit. So if I leave early uh, tonight, just so that I have the opportunity to actually go home and eat dinner and possibly see two of my children, and then maybe even spend some time with my wife, you'll have to excuse me. The second thing, for IEPs, uh, for parents and teachers, I do understand. I have a special needs son who is eight. I fought for four years against this system to get him privately placed. It is torture to watch your child be abused. If a parent raises their voice, and I have before, you have got to understand and have appreciation, which I do not believe Ms. Littlejohn does, that your most vulnerable child, your, your most vulnerable person within your house needs you and expects you to stand up. And when nobody else does and you're the only one, you do just that. And tempers did get rised or raised. They, they did become intense. It's been very harrowing experience. So I do encourage um, parents to stay as civil as they can. Um, I'm not advocating to stand up and scream and, and be crazy, but I do understand where it comes from, and I just wanted to speak to that. I've had three children uh, out of my six that have been failed by BCPS, two that I withdrew from the system just last year, uh, or just this year, pardon me, um, because of threats of violence, sexual assault, and bullying to the point of suicidal. It breaks my heart as a parent it breaks my heart. So I come to these meetings not to stare you down, not to scare you, not to scream and raise my voice, but to beg for your help. And not to have innuendo discussed after I leave, not to have my words countermanded, but to come and ask for you to come together because there are 114,000 children and all of their parents that are depending on all of you in this room and a whole bunch of folks behind me as well. So I'm gonna leave it at that and say thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. In 1995, I called Dr. Berger and requested to be involved in the school system. He appointed me to the holiday committee. And in the holiday committee, the minority religion was really upset that the school system celebrates Christmas in the school in the way we celebrate it outside and asked for the schools to close on their holidays. They threatened that if not accepted, they will boycott the schools on their holidays. They will ask their friends and the friends of their friends to do the same. And that's how the Board of Education closed on the Jewish holidays since then. Then came Dr. Hirston. I asked him in February 2004 to make me a member in the calendar committee. The members of the calendar committee truly thought that the Jewish holidays are state-approved holidays. That's their impression. And no matter how difficult it was over the years that it is difficult to make the calendar, always the Jewish holidays are school closure days. No questions. Then in January 2005, Dr. Hirston made a very important presentation the seismic change in demographics of Baltimore County. He pointed to how we are not the same as we were in the 50s or 60s. And he propelled 
no child is left behind, and all means all. And he always talked about it. And I asked him about the data, why he's closing on the, school, the schools on Jewish holidays. He had no data. I asked every president of this board to show me the data. There was no data. It was a political decision all the way back to 1995. Of course, Dr. Dance came in, and he really smiled in my face, no matter how much I showed him and showed the board that Muslim Americans deserve to have equal holidays, just like Jewish Americans. I ask you today not to propel the problem of discrimination. It's still continuing in this calendar. I really ask you to do what's right. Equal must be equal. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. I'm here tonight to state, make a statement about something that's happening in this county that started last year and is increasing to the point that it's extremely troubling to me. And that is a feeling of intimidation towards parents and towards teachers from administrators and from people in higher up in the county. I have, as many of you know, a number of clients as a special ed advocate. I've had children in the county, and I currently have my goddaughter in this county. And there is, from, coming from these parents, an increase in fear to say something because their children's education are being threatened. That should not be the case. If I don't do what you say I should do, my child loses a service. If I try to bring something to your attention and I've gone up the chain of command that you tell me to do, for instance, the teacher, the assistant principal, the principal. I'm coming to you, the assistant superintendent, or the head of special ed, and I'm saying to you, I'm not getting anywhere. Nobody's addressing my concern, and you tell me, go back to that person and not do anything about it. And that person is, in the meantime, threatening me. My child is vulnerable. I work with a whole bunch of parents whose children are vulnerable. And they're afraid to come to these meetings. They're afraid to, to send an email to our interim superintendent because their children are being threatened. And that's something that needs to stop. It's not a matter of civility. It's a matter of fear. I felt it if, as a person who works with clients, that my ability to help my clients is threatened if I continue to do my job. That needs to stop. Parents have a right to express their concerns about their children's education without our next, excuse me, Our next item on uh, the agenda is public comment on the proposed 2019-2020 school calendar. Again, I ask those who have signed up to speak to observe the three-minute clock. The first speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening. So I've been watching this calendar change, and um, my spring break keeps getting shorter and shorter every year. So um, 
this year and the past year has been quite interesting how the calendar has impacted our family because my children are receiving services in an ununique way that traditional children in Baltimore County receive. So when a child is in a home and hospital program, their calendar is not a full day, five days a week. So you select predetermined dates for a um, minimum of six hours a week. So when you have closing days on that calendar that fall back to back, then it's really hard to get the tutor that has a limited schedule as well to make up those two hours of instruction for that day. So my recommendation, um, and I don't mean to offend anybody by religion or anything like that, but um, you know my children do fall in that category of um, disability and emotional conditions. And that's always a challenge to get your typical people to understand what that challenge is. But I also come from a military family. And we have just our federal holidays off. Like, can we just stick to the federal calendar and get the traditional federal holidays off? Would that be um, less challenging than having all these days mixed out? Because at the end of the day, Every year that we do these calendars, and we still have, mind you, some schools that don't have AC that we had to close down in the beginning of the school year, um, that interrupts the child. Let's bring it back to the child, the student, okay? Let's focus on the child that are on this routine s schedule, that structure for them to receive their learning, which we know that structure and that schedule helps our children learn. So having these calendars that keep changing up so much and having these crazy days off that we're not used to and it's just driving me as a parent honestly insane. <laughs> um, and I would like to see, you know, those federal holidays. You know, I would have not had the incident happen Monday because it was Columbus Day and the federal holiday has Monday off. <laughs> so um, I really hope that's considered and Please bring our spring break. Those kids enjoy that break. It just gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And it shouldn't be like that. So I hope that could be something that could be considered. Thank you and have a good day. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. As a person who's experienced anti-Semitism for a good portion of her life, um, I think that equality is a very important thing and should be considered in the calendar. I noticed that the upcoming calendar that we're talking about um, puts professional development days on the holiest days of the year for my religion, which is also more, more of a culture to me, part of my life, as opposed to just my religion. <coughs> and I want to make sure that the board has a sensitivity to the fact that there are some of us who teach, who believe in our hearts that that is a day that we need to take off and spend time with God. And we should have that opportunity to do that without feeling that we're going to lose our jobs. And I have had that situation happen to me where I took off for one of my holidays and I lost my teaching job. And I also had my teaching certification threatened because I decided to take off my holiday. I don't have a problem with you wanting to give a Muslim holiday off, as a matter of fact. I think that that would be a very good idea because that shows equality. And I've seen way too many of my Muslim clients discriminated against even recently and I don't think that that's appropriate. 
I also have seen way too many of my black clients and a lot of other ethnic groups discriminate against be simply because their color skin is different, their religion is different from whoever is in the room having control over those services. We need to have equality on the calendar and we need to be sensitive to the beliefs of both of the people that we are telling all of a sudden, you can't have that day off. If you're, not, if you're going to give days off to the Jews and to the Christians, I wouldn't have a problem taking off the days for, for Eid and any other Muslim holiday. And I think we should also bring back some of those national holidays. Our next speaker is Abby Baton. Good evening again. I have spoken at a previous meeting about the calendar. There will never be a calendar where everyone is happy. But we have heard from many about the need for real spring break. We are pleased that the break has been added even though it is not there in its entirety. Please know that the calendar hours are incorrect as it stands now because an additional five minutes is figured into the time frame, and that was only done for this year. The memorandum of understanding we signed is only in place for this school year. We also understand that should an additional 15 minutes be added to the school day next year, it could only happen if it is negotiated and with the additional compensation for educators since they will be required to spend more time in their schools and work sites. If that occurs, we feel the calendar would need to be revisited to use the new time in a more effective way. We look forward to working with the school system to address any of these issues or others that may arise so changes can be made at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Howard Libet. Good evening. My name is Howard Libet. I'm the executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you again as we look to the 2019-2020 school calendar and the Jewish high holidays. I appreciate that the proposal for next year's school calendar acknowledges the holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, designating both of the holidays as professional development days, while not ideal, addresses the operational challenges that we've been discussing in recent years related to student and staff absences. Thousands of Jewish students will not risk missing critical learning days, and the school system won't face the significant challenge of finding and paying for hundreds and hundreds of substitute teachers, support staff, bus drivers, and school administrators. I'll admit I'm not thrilled with this solution because it still forces hundreds of Jewish teachers, staff, and administrators to miss critical professional development learning opportunities to observe the holidays. But I understand the compromise that the calendar committee had to come up with, particularly given the other calendar pressures faced by Baltimore County. I want to quickly raise two important points that I hope that the board and the administration will consider in setting this calendar. First, while all professional development is important, I hope that the professional development offered on these two days will not be so important that it will be detrimental to teachers or their students if it is missed by teachers wanting to observe the holidays. This is a particular consideration, I think, for specialized staff who may be assigned to take mandatory certification classes on these professional development days. Second, I hope that special attention could be paid to directing schools not to schedule extracurricular or athletic events on these two particular professional development days. I point this out because such events appear to be scheduled on other professional development days. For example, on the upcoming October 19th professional development day, we count at least 19 county high school athletic events being scheduled. Uh, a special thanks for this research goes to our intern from Towson High School's Public Policy Magnet Program. She's, she's terrific and been really helpful this fall. I would ask that on these professional development days for the Jewish holidays next year, a directive be given to the schools regarding not scheduling activities or athletics on these days to avoid putting Jewish students, Jewish coaches, and Jewish extracurricular advisors in an impossible situation. Thank you, as always, for your attention and your consideration. Our next speaker is Bosch Farone.
Where is the data? Where is the meat? Last board meeting, Dr. Duke, he told us that the new calendar basically uh, puts the Jewish holidays as professional day for safety reasons. Dr. Duke did not really present any data to explain how serious that safety concern is. Is it in one school, is it two schools, three schools, 100 schools, what it is? And this is a repetition of what I told you already. It was a political decision to close on one minority religion and to keep everybody else out watching. I really appreciate people asking for equality between Jewish holidays and Muslim holidays. However, I want to remind you with this thing about closing the schools as professional day, that last year Mr. Burke suggested that if we open the schools on the Jewish holidays, then we'll have the data to justify closure on the following years. My concern today with this proposed calendar is that whatever absenteeism of teachers on professional days would be used in a false way to justify opening the schools, um, closing the schools on, on the Jewish holidays in the following years. Number two, just remember that in every calendar committee I attended since 2004, professional days have been always shifted around, giving the impression that they are not important. I believe they are. So with that, I really ask you to keep that in mind. Ms. Millers asked for a motion to address the holidays two years ago in the PRC and was voted on by right side and left side and was never really uh, fulfilled. I think this is time to do that. So I remind you again that Baltimore County doesn't close on the Jewish holidays. State government doesn't close on Jewish holidays. Baltimore County Police Department don't close on Jewish holidays. St. Joseph, GBMC, Franklin Square, Sinai doesn't close on Jewish holidays. The teachers have the right to take off on their holidays no matter what religion they have. They don't have to close the whole schools, the whole system, just really because there are few members in a small area that want the whole school to be closed. That's not really fair. I really ask you to learn from the past and to appreciate Thank you, Dr. Cron. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Peace at all times to all of you. I cannot change my skin color even though I'm told this is a white nation. I cannot change my religion because I'm told it's a Christian nation. I cannot change the country of origin. They tell me I should go back where I came from. I cannot change my accent because my mother tongue, I cannot change that. No one not a single person has made this beautiful country of ours their home unless they first became an immigrant. These differences are the ones that create biases. These differences are the ones and the main cause of discriminating one another. It is up to you who are in charge of the education of our children it all starts at the top, that these differences should be accepted. 
because it's humanly impossible to change those differences. It is up to you to set an example. And if you discriminate that the Muslims are not humans, just as the Christians or the Jews are, then sure, you can continue doing what you're doing. God Almighty has given us the intellect. They know what it means. They see what it means. Our youngsters see what it means. It's your actions that speak louder than what you may say or what you even ignore to hear. All we ask is the equality, not a special treatment, not a special exemption. Just equal treatment under the law. Let's make those words that we keep saying justice for all. Is it unequal justice for all? It is supposed to be equal justice for all. Humanity cries out when there is no justice and we keep calling for peace. We keep calling for pacts and treaties. They are all meaningless unless there is equal justice because that is a prerequisite for peace. Radicalization is always because of the sense and perception and the application of justice not being done as justice. Please consider justice for Muslims as equally as everyone else and allow me to thank Ms. Sarah. I'm grateful and I'm humbled. That is the reason. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Trina Littlejohn. Good evening again. Um, unfortunately, as um, time goes on, we are seeing an increase in the number of single parent households in Baltimore County. So as you are looking at the calendar, one of two things that I'd like you to consider. Um, the first is um, with Governor Hogan's um, edict that the count that school must end on the fifth, I think it's the 15th. Um, but that there are some days that you can extend it. When a single parent is trying to make decisions and visitation um, and the child has to travel, um, they tend to do that earlier in the school year. And if the school, um, the school year is extended because of um, bad weather or if it's shortened, it's, it, it, it doesn't harm as much, but if for some odd reason it is extended and those visitation um, arrangements have already been made, it can cost that parent some money. So that um, visitation schedules is something um, that uh, often can't be changed and so that means that the child has to then miss school. Um, and it's not a legal absence in the definition. Um, so it's something I'd like you to consider when looking at it, and it's based on the edict by Governor Hogan. Um, the other thing is um, likewise with single parents, and that is spring break. Um, when you look at single parents and vacationing periods, spring break is one of the periods that a single parent um, when you have to split, if summer is a visitation that goes with one parent, um, then spring break is usually the other vacation period with the other parent. And so um, when it, that spring break is cut down to a weekend, then um, really that child is missing some important quality time with um, a parent. So. Just two things I'd like you to consider. Life is short and um, your time with your children are short. So, because they go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is the superintendent's report. Mrs. White. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening to everyone. Um, I would like to echo Tom DeHart's sentiments about happy National Principals Month. Um, we do have outstanding, hardworking, um, dedicated, committed principals, and I just want to uh, issue a thank you uh, to all of our principals for your incredible hard work each and every day. I'd like to also begin 
tonight with a special congratulations to one of our very uh, outstanding principals, Principal Sue Hirschfeld, and all staff, students, and families at West Towson Elementary School, which was recently named our 21st National Blue Ribbon School. In less than a decade, West Towson has distinguished itself as a provider of high quality, engaging instruction in a positive climate focused on equity and literacy. West Towson was selected for Blue Ribbon status in the category of exemplary high achieving school, having scored in the top 15% of all Maryland schools on the 2017 state assessments. An average of 79% of all West Towson students met or exceeded expectations in math and English language arts. So congratulations again to West Towson. I'm also pleased to announce that the Association of School Business Officials International has awarded BCPS a meritorious budget award for excellence in budget presentation for the 2018-19 school year. This marks our 16th consecutive meritorious budget award. Again, will you help me in, in celebrating our fiscal services team for this outstanding award? Now, these awards and accolades are just additional indicators to let us know that we are off to a good start this year. I've had the pleasure of visiting several schools uh, this year, and I can tell you firsthand that our administrators and teachers are uh, committed to effective instruction, and our students are engaged, and they are learning. And in keeping with uh, past practice in terms of the opening of school, especially since we are rounding the corner of already to the mid uh, point in the quarter, we will uh, be um, updating the public on the opening of school. Normally we, we do give an update on that in terms of uh, our construction process, uh, projects, uh, transportation, as well as a professional learning opportunity. So we will post that not only for the board but for the public as well. Uh, that will address um, some of the topics related to the opening of school. And so those topics will include uh, topics on safety, on service, and efficiency, and we will be posting that for the public and for the board as well. Additionally, we are happy to kick off our listening and learning tour uh, again this year. It is important um, for us to keep the lines of communication open with the community, and I am proud of the many ways that families, residents, and staff can let us know what's going on and what's going well in our schools, as well as where we need um, ha have areas for improvement. So like last year, uh, my fall listening and learning tour will visit all areas of the county, and we've already had one this year. Um, this, this uh, throughout, the, throughout this month, we'll be visiting all areas of uh, the county as well. So if you're interested in your area, please be sure to check our website. All of the dates are there, and I hope to see you there during our listening and learning tour. It's our informal conversation on what we're doing well and how we can get even better as a school system. I'd also like to highlight our gifts with purchase. Uh, last week, I had the pleasure of speaking with uh, many of our advanced technology education students and their teachers um, at the BCPS Manufacturing Day, which was sponsored by the Regional Manufacturing Institute of Maryland. Students and teachers had the opportunity to learn about cutting edge uh, manufacturing technologies from Baltimore County companies. And this is the kind of real world experience that every student deserves and that I refer to as our gift with purchase. That is that we want our young people to graduate not only with the diploma, but also with the resume. So for more examples, um, please look for our, uh, the new weekly gift with purchase series on our Team BCPS blog. Students and alumni have done everything from earning a full year's worth of college credits uh, during high school to gaining valuable experience from magnet programs, coursework, apprenticeships, and internships. And finally, I recently had the opportunity to visit our ESOL Welcome Center. And I cannot stop thinking about how comprehensive our welcome is um, for many of our families and how we treat families and treat people right. 
And so it really warms my heart um, that, that the ESOL Center that we have and how we welcome many of our families. ESOL stands for English for Speakers of Other Languages. So let's take a look at how our Welcome Center staff support the well-being of newly arrived students and their families. ESO Welcome Center, good morning. Many of the families who come through the Welcome Center are new to our country. Sure, do you speak any other language besides English? And we know how scary it can be to come to a new country and to a new school system. And we know that they want what's best for their children. So our greatest hope at the Welcome Center is that we've provided a secure and safe environment where they feel our love and our support. And then that feeling continues when they go to the schoolhouse. Hey, she, mom. Hey, she, mom. Bless you. Take care. Have a good school year. So as a pupil personnel worker for Baltimore County Public Schools, I feel it's incumbent upon us to employ a modicum of compassion. And we have to walk a mile in these families' shoes, think about where they've come from and what they've been through in order to make their transition to school here easier. And I can't tell you how grateful families are um, for the help we give them. Not only are we a welcome center, but I think year after year families come back to us because they remember how welcoming we made them feel when they first arrived. As a former ESOL student, I think that the Welcome Center is really important because as an immigrant, I know what it is to move to a new country that you barely know, and most of our families walk in here nervous and confused. So it's really, it makes us really happy to be able to answer all the questions that they have. Thanks for your patience. The girls did an amazing job on their evaluation, and now we're going to be able to go over the results. We'll talk about their school placement, grade placement, sign some documents for registration. And so we set the stage for students to succeed in Baltimore County Public Schools. Elementary and middle school students are placed age appropriately with the accurate English language support needed as they enter school in the United States. Our high school students also enter with credits, high school coursework that they've taken from overseas, and our job is to award credits for coursework completed, place them in the appropriate grade level, as well as provide the English language support needed. Okay, four of them finish the testing, but we get the result ready after they're done, they will come back and talk to you. Okay. Over the past several years, we've made a number of improvements at the Welcome Center to try to make the Welcome Center a one-stop shop for our families. What we mean by that is that the families can come here and they can work with our bilingual okay. staff in a number of areas. We now have a bilingual nurse, a bilingual PPW, a bilingual register, and a bilingual administrative secretary. All of them working together allows the families to more smoothly complete all of the registration paperwork that they would need without having to go anywhere else. Quiero agradecerles porque pues desde que llegué han sido personas muy amables que nos han atendido bien y y pues el programa es muy bueno. Mi experiencia ha sido venir acá pues con la busca de una ayuda para mí para poder estudiar y pues lo que más me ha gustado es la atención que ustedes nos han dado y la oportunidad que le están dando a los niños de poder salir adelante con sus estudios. Awesome job today. Here's the reward for you. Backpack you said that's a good supply. Thank you. Okay. Who's gonna take a pink? You? Perfect. No problem. Here's the lap pink and purple. All right, great. Good luck at the school. <laughs> Thank you very much. So again, kudos to uh, Dr. McComas and to the ESOL uh, for all of their hard work as we welcome our families the right way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next on our agenda is the chair's report, a few brief comments. Uh, this week ushered into uh, our community more good news about the Baltimore County Public School System. Uh, fully one quarter of the region's 50 best public high schools are in Baltimore County. Uh, those 13 high schools are rightfully proud, and our Baltimore County Public School leadership should also be, uh, be proud. Uh, congratulations to you all for continuing to lead a marvelous system. 
I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Police Chief Terry Sheridan and our school resource officers with the funding authorized by our local elected officials, uh, County Executive Moeller and our seven county council members. Uh, the SRO program continues to be a visual reminder of the community's commitment to a safe learning environment for our almost 115,000 students. Our children are our future and we all owe them no less. Finally, uh, in this world of 24-hour news and immediate delivery by social media of news and opinion, I thank the Baltimore County Public School System for its commitment to keeping uh, the entire community up to date on news and activities in the BCPS re uh, region. Uh, we can be proud of our schools and of our academic achievements, um, but we should also know that Baltimore County Public Schools nonstop communications about all of the goings on in our school community are worthy of our praise and support. So I thank you all in the system. Now it's time for our school board uh, school member, Ms. Adekoya. Good evening, everyone. I would first like to thank the students who provided information on the student feedback form for transportation and nutrition. I am very grateful for your input and I cannot wait to use the information collected to help in the progression of the services provided. This past week, I had the opportunity to participate in the BCSC Fall Leadership Camp with my school, Milford Mill Academy. We had the opportunity to interact, connect, and create new friendships with leaders from all over Baltimore County. The camp allowed me to network with students, gain new perspectives, insights, and feedback regarding school and system policies such as bullying and student involvement. Leaders, you are not alone. Remember to look to your fellow leaders to help you in a time of change. I share this quote with you. So early in life, I had to learn that if I want something, you must be better, you better make some noise. Malcolm X. As student leaders, you have the voice, always use it. This is an important time of the year, and I want students to be aware that one of the most visible ways to use your voice is to vote. Become informed citizens about the laws and officials running in your region. Remember, it is our responsibility of those elected who directly affect our day-to-day -day functioning, even in our own educational school system. As elections are coming up, it is important that if you are 18 or going to be 18 by November 6, 2018, you register to vote and actually get out and vote on November 6. The deadline to register online and by mail is Tuesday, October 16th. The deadline to register to vote in person is Thursday, November 1st. On October 3rd, I had the opportunity to attend the school safety tip line kickoff where Governor Larry Hogan announced the Safe Schools Maryland Initiative, which is a school safety tip line and mobile app that is used to report threats such as bullying, mental health, and anything regarding harm to oneself or community. See something, say something. Students, our lives matter. I implore you to break the code of silence. Break the idea of not saying something when it can harm a fellow pair. One time, oftentimes in a cohort, at least one person is aware of a danger that can appear. We must realize that we are charged with the task of speaking up simply because it can save a life or plenty of lives. The tip hotline number is 833 632-7233, and the app can be downloaded. This month is National Bullying Prevention Month, and Team BCPS is actively participating in activities and planning for system-wide events during the week of October 22nd to 26th. Our staple slogan is kindness matters, because guess what? Kindness does matters. Never do to someone what you would not want done to you or somebody that you love. This year, I, along BCSC, are challenging each and every person who is a part of Team BCPS to pledge that I stand against bullying because I stand with kindness, now, not later. Oftentimes, we pledge that we are going to be kind and our actions don't always follow. I ask you as we move forward as a county, pressing forward to change, to stop the bullying without our, within our communities, we must pledge that we are what we say we are going to be. We are Team BCPS and we are kind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is item I, personnel matters, and for that we invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and leaves of absence. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented as exhibits <coughs> I-1 through I-3? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, <coughs> seven, eight, nine, ten. The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. 
Next on our agenda is uh, consideration of action taken in closed session. I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, earlier this evening, the board considered four appeals regarding confidential student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. All four were considered on the record as there were no requests for oral argument made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions that were taken in closed session in those matters which were a hearing examiner numbers 19-04, 19-05, 19-09, and 19-10. We'll do them one at a time. Do I have a motion to approve the action in closed session on uh, 1904? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, opposed? Abstain? Recuse. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve uh, the action in closed session on 1905? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Abstain? And recuse. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on 1909? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Abstain and recuse. Motion carries. And the last one, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on 1910? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Abstain and recuse. All those carry. Thank you. Thank you. And the Mr. orders are sitting on the table over there. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item K, and that's contracts, and I ask Mr. Stewart to take the floor. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the Building Contracts Committee met to consider items K1 through K11 on your list or agenda. Uh, by unanimous vote, we recommended for the full approval of the board those items. Do I have a motion to approve items K1 through K11? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. I just want to point out the fact that the board has not been given copies of the actual contracts. All right. Any further comments? All in favor of the motion to approve K1 through K11, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Opposed? One. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Next on our agenda is board member comments, and we'll start with Mr. Hayden. It started with me last time. <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, time of year that we're in, with all sorts of elections. Microphone. You really want to hear this? <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you a break, and you turned it down. I think everything that's going on now with elections certainly gives us pause to think about what we as a board are doing and what the future of the board is. There are some board members who are up uh, for uh, elections coming up on election day and uh, uh, I think two of them, if my math is correct, who, who are running for election to the board. and. Uh, so I would like people to certainly consider people who have that experience as they do uh, when they vote because the board itself really does need a level of experience. It's not something you can jump into and say, I can pick this up overnight, it's really easy stuff. It's not, you need time and you need involvement. So hopefully people can consider that when they go into the voting booths. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Uh, it's disappointing that the board did not find it worthwhile to add an agenda item to discuss the preservation of system records during a comprehensive audit of BCPS contracts, procurement, and vendor relationships. Ms. White made public our drastic modification uh, to our, our directive, which was passed by the board at the last board meeting. The new board directive has the effect of making impotent the previous cease and desist order 
that preserved records critical to the audit and possible future investigations. There are numerous questions and concerns about the new directive and the state of the system's record retention and destruction practices. This is an urgent matter. The board should be proactive in this. Once records are destroyed, they're gone. We're spending a significant sum on, on a warranted audit. The board must ensure that the audit has integrity. On another um, note, early voting begins just 15 days from today. Um, education has always been an important campaign issue, but I believe this cycle it is especially so, especially as we uh, move to become a hybrid board. Um, so it's going to be an exciting year next year with a lot of changes, and I encourage all BCPS stakeholders to educate themselves on the issues and candidates and get out and vote. Change the board, and we can change BCPS. Mrs. Hen. Thank you. Um, one month ago, on September 8th, I requested that transportation concerns be added to our 925 board meeting agenda. Um, our children's safe arrival to and from school needs to be an issue that we prioritize as a board, so I'm very disturbed that we have not done so as of yet. Um, specifically, I ask that staff address constituent concerns with regards to bus capacity and the plans to address, driver recruitment and retention, bus assignments, why many students did not receive assignments at the beginning of the year, um, driver training, both initial, ongoing, and corrective communication plans, um, between, specifically between school administrators and families, the roles and responsibilities of our transportation office versus school staff, routing um, adjustments and improvements, the status of the AVL system and rollout of the capability to, for families to monitor the location of their students, as well as any other transportation topics and questions submitted by our community. So I again ask that we include this item on the agenda of an upcoming board um, meeting for consideration and to address this once and for all. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that, uh, number one, I agree with Ms. Miller regarding the importance and urgency around the issue of Baltimore County Public Schools purging documents while we are in the midst of an external audit um, for reasons of rebuilding the public trust after multiple ethical violations. Um, I also agree with Ms. Hen around transportation. It is a very important issue. The bus is our students' first classroom. And so we want that first classroom to be the start of the day that's going to help them engage in their learning and take advantage of all the academic opportunities that we put in front of them for the rest of the day and then to get them home safely. So it's very important that we address that. Um, I hope that the start of school report includes sufficient data uh, to let us know the uh, concerns of transportation are being addressed. Also, in regarding the rollout of our new devices to 30,000 high school students in addition to the rest of the students, <coughs> that we understand what volume of concerns there are, what the issues are, and how they're being addressed. Um, additionally, there are families that do not have options for internet access at home. I represent over 200 square miles of the 600 square mile county, and I can tell you in those rural areas, uh, there are issues. So hopefully there's um, an understanding of how many families are impacted and what are the options for those families. Um, also, I do wanna say that um, it is exciting to be in the start of the school year. Things are still fresh. The kids still have their pencils and pens. They haven't lost everything yet. Um, so it is exciting to start the school year. I also want to say it was exciting to attend the Maryland Association's Boards of Education Conference last week. Um, it was uh, really special to see Mr. Chuck McDaniels, who'd been the previous president for MABE. He was retired and uh, the new president was installed. And it's always great to meet with board members from around the state. Uh, the state superintendent was there as well as the MABE staff to receive updates around the work that's going on throughout the state. It's really very encouraging. We heard a uh, informative and comprehensive update from our state superintendent. The um, the issues are all around excellence and equity. And as we know, we have challenges, but we 
are dedicated to meeting those challenges, to working together, to learning more ways that we can work together and to understand the issues, see what best practices are being used elsewhere, and just to have that time to be creative and brainstorm. So that was really very exciting. Um, I also echo that the elections are important um, and it is exciting and historic for Baltimore County. So I hope people get informed and take advantage of that opportunity. Um, I have a lot of hope for the new segment that's coming into Baltimore County Public Schools with the new board. And I think that uh, people should get involved and, and, and be involved and engaged in that. Um, also, I wanna say October is quite a busy month. As we've already heard, um, it's Principal Appreciation Month. It's also D Dyslexia Awareness Month. And it was nice to hear from CCAC about the uh, benefits that we are doing with improving Orton-Gillingham training and expanding that, um, and the other things that, are, that staff is working on. So that's great to hear about that. We also had National Custodian Day. And as anyone that has cleaned up after one child, they definitely appreciate our building operations staff that takes care of these buildings after thousands and thousands of children. So we definitely wanna give a shout out to them. Um, it's also cancer awareness, and it's also walk or ride your bike to school day coming up. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going that, that's going on. I also wanted to point out that we do have uh, outstanding schools in Baltimore County Public Schools. We have um, three of the, the three high schools in my district were on that list of uh, Baltimore County High Schools among the region's top, Hereford High School, Delaney High School, Lock Raven High School, uh, that both, all three of those schools attained high rankings for school, for the best teachers, and also for uh, college prep. So very proud of that. Um, just so many dedicated teachers and administrators working hard every day. Um, and lastly, I just wanna say that as a board, the comments that we hear, both that come to us at these meetings, but emails and other methods, that they do matter. And even though folks may not get an acknowledgement, there are people that are taking your comments to heart, and there are improvements that are being made, and in the future, um, that can e be even greater. So I would just encourage people to continue to come to the board meetings, continue to give feedback in whichever manner um, you feel comfortable with. We all have emails um, and so forth. Um, and to point out that one of our public com comment uh, speakers said tonight is a concern about retaliation and intimidation. We really do need to address the issues when people feel that. We can't just dismiss it and say it's a, it's a minor thing. Um, because we know that it has been an issue um, and we need to do more to fully understand, especially when we're talking about parents with fragile students. Um, one can see where it's very, very critical that we provide confidence to those parents that their children are being taken care of because we know as a school system, we value each and every child. Um, and so we just need to work on that and that's something that I'm definitely committed to. So thank you very much. Mr. Yulfeder. Thank you. I'd like to comment on some of the comments that have been made so that the public understands uh, the, uh, what the situation is relative to documents and document retention. With very few exceptions, uh, there have been no documents or records uh, shredded that have not been within the policy, uh, the retention policy of the school system. So for the public to believe that there's been a wholesale uh, destruction of documents, uh, that's the wrong impression. Uh, the other comment relative to uh, retention is that right now we have an audit going on, going back to 2012. And I would wait until the audit report has been issued to determine whether there are any documents that the auditors have requested that have not been made available or that could not be found. So this is not prejudged that there are, with the impression that there's lots of documents that have been destroyed. It's a very false impression. Thank you. Before I pass it on to Mr. Stewart, I just wanna join in and 
thank Mr. McDaniels for serving the State Boards of Education um, uh, through being the chair of MABE. So we all thank you. Mr. Stewart. Thank you. So we had the pleasure of cutting the ribbon today at Lansdowne Elementary School. I thought it was a fabulous event, but just speaks to an incredible promise that we have in that school and uh, the incredible inner workings of our team um, from staff and teachers and the principal there to our construction and facilities team. There's a lot of work that goes into uh, building a school like that, of that caliber and uh, creating a palpable sense of energy and excitement. Um, so well done to all involved. Uh, I also want to take a moment and just note and commend the administration and Ms. White on the training program regarding non-certificated employees. I think something like that could pass us by very quickly and we wouldn't take time to actually appreciate the energy, the effort that went into it at the time. Uh, I mean, that is how truly we make our system better. Um, and sometimes it doesn't involve uh, newspaper articles and shouting and so forth. It can involve something just like that. So often good to point that out. Um, we are celebrating this Saturday at Hillcrest Elementary, uh, 50 years of success and excitement there. And so it's going to be a great event and would welcome all comers. Um, and speaking of honoring the works of giving hands, there's going to be a celebration of life ceremony uh, at Hillcrest Elementary for our board member um, who passed away recently, which is uh, Mike Bowler. And just to say a quick word about Mike, uh, when I came onto the board, he was representing, of course, my area, and I knew I had big shoes to fill. Uh, he had been a force for good for many years, before and during, uh, and after his board service. And he had this restless desire to make things better. Um, I read a phrase once, um, the eternal inner murmur, um, and I think it's apt for him. It kind of kept him involved and other focused, even when he was engaged in the battle of his life against cancer. And I can't think of a more important trait for our world right now. Um, and though we may have had to say goodbye to Mike, I have every confidence that that inner murmur continues in the lives he touched, and it does in mine. Thank you. Ms. Adekoya. I just want to say a word of encouragement for all the students out there. Whenever you find yourself doubting how far you can go, just remember how far you have come. Remember everything you have faced, all the battles you have won, and all the fears you have overcome. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to reflect for a moment for, uh, on the report that we received at our last board meeting on uh, student performance measures. Um, I thought it was very important, the points that Ms. Adekoya and Mr. Yulfelder made about the influences of poverty on our student achievement. There is certainly a lot of research, and it's irrefutable that that's a, a challenge. And also, there's a challenge uh, in comparing our achievement levels uh, with jurisdictions that may have different demographics. But again, I also recognize the importance of what Ms. Causey pointed out, that regardless of how our students are coming to us, not kindergarten ready or maybe facing poverty situations, we can't limit the aspirations of these students. Um, we can't accept anything other than excellence for all of our students. And it just seems like a real opportunity for us to really work as a team. I think we all want the same thing, and sometimes we get tied up on the semantics of what we're using. Um, but I heard Ms. White talk about the challenges we have with numeracy. I, I know Dr. Brown long enough to know that he's not comfortable that we've got everything fixed. So we all know that wherever we are, we got to get better. And I think if we just keep that in mind, we can work together. Sometimes we're just fighting and saying the same thing. So I really think, you know, being data driven and using what Dr. Brown gave us is a real opportunity for us to move forward. And, and I think we can build around that. That's, that's it for me. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, I did applaud for my seatmate uh, because of his service uh, with me, but I also want to thank him for allowing me to uh, practice my drafting skills with the Resolutions Committee uh, of uh, the Maryland Association of Boards of Education uh, and also on the Federal Relations Network Committee uh, to see that, uh, well, thank you, to see uh, Mutual Admiration Society, to see uh, how our, our system really kind of fits in a, in a larger context 
statewide and also in a larger context nationally. And the issues that we grapple with as a board are very much being grappled with by other systems around uh, our state and in our country. I also want to congratulate two of our six district art teachers who were recently recognized by the Maryland Art Education Association. Camille Gibson, who I mentioned earlier at our Golden Ring Middle School, and uh, Caitlin uh, Tully at our Parkville um, uh, School. Um, the, um, the work of these two art teachers is really to be commended, and the fact is, that uh, art is a reason for children to come to school and to celebrate their creativity because I believe uh, art is linked to excellence and also art uh, nurtures a creative soul. Lastly, uh, I am proud to wave my proud alumni uh, banner uh, because uh, on Saturday uh, the 6th at 10 a.m. is the Kenwood High School Homecoming Parade. So if you don't have plans, come on down to Essex and join in the parade. Oh Thank, you. Thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Young. So I want to say congratulations to um, Franklin and Pikesville for being among the region's 50th best, but also I'm going to piggyback on something Ms. Atacoya said earlier when she spoke about um, bullying and harassment. She gave out the phone number for the state, but on our BCPS website under the safety focus tab is a link to the bullying, harassment, and intimidation form. It can be filled out by parents or students. If you also feel that if you see something and it's not you, you can still say something and it will be investigated. Thank you. All right, uh, our next meeting is October 23rd. Uh, I remind board members that there are orders on the side table to sign. The meeting is adjourned.